Hello and welcome to the Tripwire IP360 Learning Labs training webinar, Vulnerability Scoring, the Measurement of Risk. Today we will look at how to focus your limited resources on your most critical assets by gaining a better understanding of different scoring systems and how to best leverage vulnerability prioritization models. Following the presentation will be a brief update from the Tripwire VERT team on September and October months in review. And now I'd like to introduce our pre presenter, who is the manager of Tripwire's security research and development. Please welcome Tyler Reguli. Thanks, Ed. Hi, everybody. As uh, Ed mentioned, we're going to talk about vulnerability scoring today, uh, the measurement of risk, and some of the different ways that we can do that. So, you know, why are we here? Uh, one, you know, we're going to talk about why we score vulnerabilities. Uh, we'll take a look at, you know, sort of the five most common scoring methods and then an extra one that I've thrown in there to talk about. Uh, we'll really dive into IP360 scoring and look at how that works. And then we're going to loop back and talk about why prioritization methods really matter uh, and, you know, sort of what we're going to get out of those. So why do we score vulnerabilities? I'm sure many of you have heard this before. I definitely have. Why not fix everything? Um, it's, you know, a misconception that there's just a magic button you can push and suddenly a system is completely up to date and there's there's no need to worry about patching anything further. We all know that's not the case. And so the main reason to score a vulnerability is for prioritization. Um, this is probably the, the main takeaway uh, and what I'll focus on the most as we go through the following slides. So when you're talking about prioritization, you're talking about should I apply patch A or patch B? Uh, which one is more important? And there are both objective and subjective ways that you can come to that conclusion, and we're going to talk about how to make it as objective as possible. Secondly is measurement. You know, one, how vulnerable is a system? A great way to do that is to take the overall score of the individual vulnerabilities. How vulnerable is my network? The overall score of how vulnerable are your hosts? You can also use it, though, to benchmark within different departments in your company to compare yourselves uh, in your vertical, uh, or just as a way to ensure that you're improving, you know, week over week, month over month, year over year, uh, to actually measure your progress. And finally, as I said, objectivity. You know, there's, there's a lot in the security world that is subjective. Um, vulnerability scoring helps you to remove some of that subjectivity, uh, helps you remove some of the, the, you know, the I feel we need to fix this from the equation so that you can focus on what you really need to fix and, and know that you're making a sound decision. And so how we'll talk about this is by looking at a number of scoring methods that are out there. There's, there's definitely more than one approach. Um, you know, there's, there's not necessarily a, a one-size-fits-all approach to scoring. And, you know, it might be that you use multiple scoring methods combined in order to speak to different teams uh, within your company, in order to uh, address different types of issues. And it's important to understand what's available, how they work, and, you know, the advantages and disadvantages that each of them present. And so we'll start with, with HML, or high, medium, low scoring. This is the most basic of scoring systems. You're presented with three buckets. You know, your, your high critical, your, your high vulnerabilities, which are your most critical, your medium vulnerabilities, and the, the low vulnerabilities that are, you know, probably not even on your radar, uh, as long as you have high and medium. It's a really broad categorization. You're kind of just tossing vulnerabilities into the bucket. Um, and sort of one of the one of the key examples that we see when we look out into the security world for this is Microsoft. They use it for their security bulletins. They do have four buckets instead of three, but you'll see them all labeled as critical, important, moderate, and low. And I think, you know, as we move into this next slide here with the pros, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense for a company like Microsoft who has to convey that information to a wide variety of people. You know, you've got people who are very adept at security who really understand it, 
And then you got the home users who, you know, they might not be dealing with security on a regular basis, and so they just need to know what they need to patch. And buckets like high, medium, low, critical, important, moderate, um, really help you convey that. They're easy to use. They're easy to understand. You can take any other scoring system that's out there and do a very rough translation into this system. So there is that advantage that it's the easiest to communicate and explain to somebody else. And that's great when you're having a conversation, when you're, you're sharing information with the masses. Where it starts to fall apart is when you need to get in there and start to prioritize. And I said, you know, one of the things we're going to talk about a lot here is prioritization. And when you have high, medium, and low, there's a very little uh, distinction between vulnerabilities. You've only got the three buckets, four buckets. Um, you don't have a lot of uh, ground to sort of move around. So if you're talking about a network where, and I'll use this number a lot today, you've got, say, 10,000 vulnerabilities. Let's say that it's a, an even three-way split. You know, you've got 3,300 vulnerabilities in each of those buckets. How do you further narrow down that high bucket when there's so much in there. You're not patching 3,300 vulnerabilities at once. So it, it becomes really difficult to see your priorities as well because you're just, you know, you're subjectively throwing them into buckets. There's no rhyme or reason to how you're necessarily picking a bucket. There might be a, okay, this is critical because of the following. Uh, there's no formula. It's, it's not necessarily reproducible. And there's no real representation of risk. A vulnerability that's in the high bucket might be low risk, but might be there for other subjective reasons. And at the same time, there's no centralized scoring. So while a specific vendor that uses the HTML approach, they may have centralized scoring, they have a, may have a method of determining it. Across vendors uh, and across the industry, you're not going to see a this is high, this is medium, and this is low structure, which, you know, um, uh, this, you know, little clip art guy here, it, it gives you a headache. Um, it's, a, it's definitely a source of frustration when you, you can't prioritize vulnerabilities in that way. And, you know, we're going to see that with some of these other systems as well as we walk through them. The next approach, uh, I like to call it the yardstick approach. It's any of the, the numeric systems of measurement. CVSS is somewhat of an example of this. They are a, a yardstick. However, they are based on a formula as opposed to just assigning a value. Um, yardstick is really just an expansion on the, the, the high, medium, low system. Uh, it, it just it gives you a little bit more granularity and can be easier to speak to in terms of sort of scaling because you're talking about numbers and you don't necessarily need to have that upper and lower bound that you have with named buckets. And there's some pros. One, it's easy to expand. Uh, your buckets. It's easy to grow your your ranking scale. So, you know, we're looking at a, a ruler here that goes from 0 to 18. You know, it, uh, maybe tomorrow it goes to 20, goes to 25. Um, you, you can definitely grow it. It's also really easy to rank and sort. So if we've got a vulnerability that scores a 5 on our scale, let's say that there was another one that scored a 3, and another one that scored a 7. Um, you know, most of us have been counting for a long time, and we're going to know that 3 is lower than 5, and 5 is lower than 7. And so we can see the ranking, and we can see how the vulnerabilities get sorted um, relatively easily. The flip side, however, is that there are definitely, you know, a lot of the same cons that we saw with the HML approach. Again, yardstick is subjective. You're just assigning a number. There's, again, no real measurement of risk, um, no true representation of it. There might be an opinion-based representation of risk, um, but there's no hard structural representation. And again, it can be difficult to see your priorities because we're talking about generally a 1 to 5, a 1 to 10 rating. And, you know, if you've got, again, 10,000 vulnerabilities and you've got a 1 to 5 scoring system, you know, that's still 2,000 that are falling at each level. And, uh, you know, as somebody here at Tripwire likes to say, um, you know, which five is the highest five? And, you know, you can start to see that when you have these, these different scales, you know, and you start to rank, say, a nine on each scale. Um, they fall into different places. They're not necessarily uh, indicative of the same thing. 
And so you need to have not only an understanding of what the score is, but what the scale of the yardstick is and how it's being measured. And again, you have the same issue as you had with HML. There's no centralized scoring for this. There's there's no clear guide out there that says this is how we're scoring this. Luckily, uh, this was identified as a problem a while ago. And so CVSS v2 uh, was the second version of the Common Vulnerability Scoring System released in 2007. And it, it sought to address this problem, to give us something that was uh, based in objectivity, that was based in math, um, that could be used as a real form of measure. And so it provided us a scale from 0, 0.0 to 10.0, giving us 100 possible values. And it broke the metrics into three groups. The base metric, which is the fundamental characteristics of a vulnerability. So we're talking about things like impact on the CIA triangle. We're talking about attack vector, uh, authentication, um, all of the things that make a vulnerability what it is. And then there were there were two additional groups that you could use to, to modify and manipulate that score. The first being temporal, where you had things like report confidence, uh, the availability of a fix, the availability of exploit code. Um, so looking at the time-based characteristics of that vulnerability. And finally, finally, environmental, which allowed you to see how the vulnerability you know, stacked up in your environment in specific situations. And it gave you a number of metrics where the values could be set that would modify the base and temporal scores to make them uh, more suited to your environment. And, you know, there were a number of pros to this. One, the addition of temporal scoring, you know, gave us our, an example of how we could demonstrate risk, how we could actually represent it. Um, it also gave us something that's much more finely grained than Yardstick or HML because it has a number of, of defining characteristics that we can understand, we can figure out exactly what goes into that score. It also allows for much easier ranking and prioritization. Um, again, it is, a, it is just a, an extended Yardstick approach, but we can put a bit more faith into it because it does have um, some objective scoring behind it. It's not just a number pulled out of a hat. And if you take a look at the image here uh, from cvedetails.com, you can see that there's a, you know, a, an average score of 6.8, which means that there is some distribution across the range, um, which is a good thing. And finally, it's somewhat considered to be a universal standard. Um, you know, so there's, there's two question marks on this page, objective and universal standard. And we're going to talk about both of those and how they are pros, um, but they're not um, clear-cut examples of pros of CVSS v2. And they sort of translate into the cons of the system as well. And that's that CVSS v2 is also very subjective. Um, there was very limited and confusing scoring guidance around CVSS v2. There were a number of um, examples given when the standard was released that didn't reflect how the scoring was applied by various entities and that didn't reflect the necessary, necessarily the actual meaning of the values. Um, as well, it's not really centralized. We accept it as a universal standard. A number of, of various industry standards reference it. Um, a lot of them will point to NVD as the the point of reference, but you know it's important to remember that CVSS can be calculated by anyone, uh, and the values can be uh, can change from vendor to vendor, uh, from analyst to analyst. And uh, one prime example of that uh, is you know the modification of CVSS v2 scores. Uh, and one vendor that you know famously did this was Oracle, with the addition of partial plus. So within the CIA triangle, um, the, the options were none, partial compromise, or complete compromise. And the intention was that complete was the full system, and that was how you got to a 10.0, uh, whereas partial would give you a lower score because the system wasn't fully compromised. Oracle didn't believe that a full compromise of a database should be the same as a full compromise of the system. 
that could be arguable depending on what data you're storing in your database. It could be worse than gaining OS access. Um, but they came up with partial plus, which was a value that existed between partial and between complete. And so anytime you looked at the Oracle website and saw their CVS SV2 scores, it was actually a modified score uh, and not necessarily representative of CVS SV2 overall, which, you know, that adds a little bit more subjectivity into the, the equation, makes things a little bit more confusing. And then two other sort of issues with CVS SV2. Some of the metrics um, were a little questionable, uh, especially if you were looking at it from a prioritization standpoint. Uh, report confidence is one of my favorite examples of this, which is found in the temporal metric. And report confidence is how much can you trust the report of this vulnerability? Is it actually a vulnerability is essentially the question that it asks. And the problem I have with that is that if you're prioritizing you know, patching in your environment, if you're prioritizing workarounds and fixes, if you're prioritizing these vulnerabilities so that you can deal with them and triage them, then you're going to be fairly certain that it's a real issue. Um, you know, it, why are you looking for items that may not even be real? Um, so to me that added very little value when I started to look at vulnerabilities. And I think a lot of people felt the same way. And finally, and we have here another graph from CVE details, um, you can see when you start to look at the bar chart that while we have these 10 ranges, there are five of them that contain the bulk of the assigned values. And the other five aren't really used. So we've now cut half of the actual ranges off. And if you were to take this and break it out into the 100 values, so everywhere from 0.0, .0 to 10.0, and, and dig into them, you would actually find the score distributions even a little scarier with certain values. 10.0, uh, 9.3 uh, are some of the more famous ones uh, in that 9 to 10 category, uh, representative of the bulk of the scores. And that was due to um, the way that analysts would assign values to them. Um, it led to a the biases that were used um, led to a, a smaller use of the range than was actually available. But this was recognized, and version 3 of CVSS was released last year. Uh, it was three years in the making before its release, had some major changes over CVSS v2, um, particularly in the base scoring. And, you know, some of the big ones that changed here in the additions were scope and user interaction. Uh, scope is, uh, as I can best des describe it, an exact counter to partial plus, uh, to the, the modification that Oracle was using. So the scope lets you define if you are, uh, when, you know, when the vulnerability is exploited, do you remain within the exploited application or do you pivot and gain control outside of it? So do you hit the database and stop there or do you hit the database and move on to the operating system, for example? Uh, it's, you know, it's a great inclusion, it makes a lot of sense, um, and it, it helps eliminate some of those vendor-specific additions that CVS SV2 saw. The other one that makes a lot of sense is user interaction, and we're going to actually see this on the next slide in the pros, but we'll talk a bit about it here. And with user interaction, we're talking about, you know, and for an Outlook vulnerability, for example, is it exploited as soon as it's displayed in the preview pane? Or does the user have to click on it? Is there something the user has to do to trigger that vulnerability? And again, with the number of client-side attacks that require user interaction um, that we see today, it's great to make that distinction. So there were definitely some, some real improvements that went into CVS SV3. And then we have the environmental metrics. These were changed. So in CVS SV2, the environmental metrics are unique. They're their own set of values that you score and populate. In V3, uh, they change to being replicas of the base score. So basically all environmental metrics means in CVSS V3 is that you are rescoring the base score of the vulnerability to better suit your environment. I'm still not sure where I stand on that one personally. Um, since there is no centralized repository still for CVSS, um, I feel like that just could have been the base score applied to different environments, and environmental metric may have lost uh, 
uh, some of the power that it had in CVSS v2. But there, there are definitely some pros that accompanied CVSS v3. And I think the biggest one by far was that there was much clearer guidance on how to score vulnerabilities. There was a, a document published with 23 examples that laid out how it was scored in CVSS v2 versus v3, the changes and why they happened. Uh, as I said, user interaction uh, being included in the scoring process was an excellent change, made a lot of sense. And the industry feedback group, so the, the CVSS SIG that was formed uh, to discuss the changes, it was much larger and much more diverse than the CVSS v2 SIG, um, which, you know, generated a lot of feedback from a lot of areas um, that I think really accounted for a bunch of the improvements. It allows for ranking and prioritization, as did its predecessor. Um, I, I still put a question mark on objective. Um, and again, we're going to talk about that in the cons. And it does give a minimal measurement of risk with its temporal score. Uh, again, much like CVSS v2, that temporal score is not used a whole lot. A lot of people rely on just the base score, which removes that, that risk measurement. And uh, for anyone who wants to take a screenshot at this point, um, there's a URL um, for a blog post that I wrote on the Tripwire State of Security that uh, that actually discusses CVSS v3 in a lot more detail. On the side of the cons, uh, we want to once again have our friend with the headache back here, and that's because CVSS v3 is still subjective. Um, there are still a number of different ways that people are scoring it. And I think it has the potential to be a very objective scoring system. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the analysts that are working for it, I think, are responsible uh, for damaging its reputation in this way. You see a lot of differences of opinions in scoring and a lot of biases reflected uh, in the scores that do get published. Again, no centralized scoring. The closest we have is NVD. Um, and it's what everyone uses, uh, but some vendors are publishing their own scores. Uh, those scores may not always match the scores that NVD publishes, and again, you have different analyst biases uh, greatly impacting the scoring that comes out of it. And a big one, an issue that I have, and here's a link uh, to a blog post I have on this subject. There's some really contradictory language uh, that has gone out a little more recently. It wasn't there initially uh, around attack vector in CVSS v3. And this was one of the uh, biggest issues with CVSS v2. Um, there was no consistency in scoring uh, when you were talking about attack vector. And, you know, it, it changed in CVSS v3. The definition changed. Um, it became much clearer what it described. Uh, unfortunately, analysts weren't using it or scoring it that way, which led to some questions. And the clarification that came out completely contradicts the original uh, language surrounding attack vectors. So you can go there and read the blog post. Um, it's, it's definitely one of the biggest cons in CVSS v3, and probably the thing that holds it back from becoming a you know standardized open scoring system that I think would work on a, on a larger scale. And up next, I wanted to talk about hype-based scoring. And this is one where I'm not going to get into pros and cons. I just think it's important to mention, because we, you know, one of the things I said, you know, why do we score vulnerabilities? We score them for objectivity. And in the case of hype-based scoring, it's all about subjectivity. It's all about being subjective. And here we have, for the most part, branded vulnerabilities. Uh, there are some non-branded vulnerabilities that fall into this. Now, don't get me wrong, there are plenty of branded vulnerabilities that are critical, um, but we end up seeing from time to time companies that discover a vulnerability, want it to get more attention, and they'll create a website, a graphic, they'll name it, and they'll put out a press release. And journalists will pick that up, they'll run with it, you know, they'll quote the original company from the press release, they'll, they'll reference the branded vulnerability, and they'll really hype up an issue that maybe shouldn't be hyped. And you end up with uh, subjective scoring in this case. You end up with opinion-based scoring. And 
you know, I've, I've spoken to customers in the past who said, oh, my boss usually doesn't care what we're patching, but the news was all of a sudden talking about insert branded vulnerability here. And suddenly, you know, I was getting a call at seven o'clock in the morning saying, what are we doing about this? It's on my morning TV show. And I noticed that, you know, mainstream television tends to pick up the, the branded vulnerabilities much more. Uh, even here in Toronto, our breakfast TV show um, tends to pick them up and talk about them with their, their social media analyst, uh, who again is probably not in a position to really talk about vulnerabilities. Um, they're not a security researcher, they're, they're a social media person, and, but they do because they're named, because they're there. Um, and that tends to really up the hype further. Um, so it's something that I wanted to put out there, wanted to touch on. It's something that when you're talking about vulnerability scoring, you need to really be aware of. And that takes us to Tripwire IP360 scoring. Um, something that a lot of people don't realize is that it is one of the oldest existing scoring systems, uh, you know, predates CVSSV2 by a number of years. We're talking about a scoring system that's over 15 years old at this point, um, yet still manages to hold its own against all of the, the modern releases of uh, scoring systems. And well, we often think of it as date, skill, and risk because those are the three values that we reflect in the algorithm, which we'll dig into in a couple of slides. It's actually a measure of the vulnerability's age, the skill required, the attack vector, and the exploit outcome. And those are, you know, not that different than, for example, what you'll see in something like CVSS, uh, but without a lot of the fluff, for lack of a better word, that CVSS can tend to add. Um, as well, it has no upper bound, so we're not constrained to a zero to 10 scale. We're not constrained to a yardstick. Uh, scores can continue to grow, so even if you have, you know, 10,000 vulnerabilities in your environment to go back to that number, you know, our highest vulnerability score at the moment is 65,000. So there's lots of room to see the difference, to see the priorities, um, and actually make a, a, come to a decision on, on your patching process. And as well, it is customizable, um, something that, again, a lot of customers that I speak to don't seem to realize, so we'll get to a slide and we'll talk about that as well uh, in just a minute. Uh, but again, I wanted to go through the pros. Um, I, I personally think, you know, I've, I've been working with IP360 and vulnerability scoring for over a decade. Uh, and I think one of the things we do uh, quite well is make things better. Um, you know, we have very objective scoring that is centralized. We're going to talk a lot more about that in a minute. We have for two different ways of prioritizing your vulnerabilities. One is score-based, where you're not constrained to three buckets or one to five. Uh, the other is using the heat map approach, and we'll take a look at a picture of that in a second. It gives you a clear representation of the risk that's involved with a vulnerability. Um, and that's the, this is the first time that I could put that on a slide about a scoring system uh, as I went through all of these. And I think that's important when you are prioritizing, when you're trying to triage a vulnerability. And it's regularly maintained and reviewed. And again, we're going to talk more about that as we move through these. But as I did with all the other scoring systems, I think it's important to talk about the cons that uh, exist here as well. Um, and they're, they're not the biggest. They're, they're definitely minor compared to a lot of the other scoring systems. But one of them is, is that brand new vulnerabilities are generally scored low. Now, some people look at this as a negative, so I wanted to address it in two different ways. The first is to talk about the Verizon data breach report. And I'm not sure if anyone read it when it came out a few months back or not. Uh, but one of the things that it pointed to was the vulnerability exploitation statistics for 2015. There were 900 plus vulnerabilities seen in the wild, but only 75 of those were released in 2015. So that means that over 90% of vulnerabilities actively exploited in 2015 were more than a year old. That's a huge number. And it's something that is important to factor in when you're talking about that level of scale, you want to factor in vulnerability age. As well, if you take a look further into the statistics and the numbers, the oldest exploited vulnerability was from 1998. That made it 17 years old. And the bulk of exploited vulnerabilities were from between 2007 and 2011, you know, making them at, mo or at least four years old. And so age is an important factor. And it's one that's often overlooked, often due to uh, 
the subjectivity of new vulnerabilities due to hype-based uh, vulnerabilities. And so it's important to address that. And as well here, I have a picture of our heat map. And you know, this is a removal of age from the equation, if that's something that you want to do. And it puts you into a set of buckets. And so what you can see here is you have I believe it's 36 buckets if you go across, not including the exposures. And you can very easily, you know, find the, the, the category of automated exploit and remote privilege. That's your top right, your most risk. So you can still prioritize quite easily with the scoring system without accounting for date, if that is your preference. The other thing is that we are vendor specific. And this is something that, you know, it's just something to be aware of. Um, others have tried to copy our scoring system, mostly unsuccessfully. And the reason why they've been unsuccessful is the same reason uh, that we have a fairly objective uh, scoring system with a centralized uh, repository of knowledge. And that's that all of our scoring is done by VERT. And this is, I think, important uh, to talk about, mainly because it's my team. Uh, we spend a lot of time on this. Scoring is one of the most frequently discussed topics uh, with Invert. And just to give you a bit of background, um, there's over a century of security experience with Invert. We have college professors, uh, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, uh, computer engineers. We have people with programming backgrounds, IT operations backgrounds. We have a whole slew of skill sets available to us. And that lets us look at things from the enterprise SMB and end user viewpoints, uh, which is very important. And we have uh, a wide array of both theoretical and hands-on knowledge in the team. And so one of the things that I've talked about when I talked about the cons of some of the scoring systems was that you have these analyst biases that end up impacting score. And one of the things that we do to try and avoid that from impacting our scores is that no score is touched by fewer than two people. We always make sure that somebody is scoring it and somebody is reviewing it. Um, there are examples where we expand upon that even further. On Patch Tuesday, for example, all of the scores are reviewed by the entire team. Uh, we think the Microsoft patches warrant that uh, in-depth conversation, and it's something that we make sure we do. As well, if we have a, you know, a disagreement between the two people that look at it, or if we feel that our bias towards a certain subject area uh, is influencing our score, we will step away, we'll have a team meeting, uh, and we'll take a look at the vulnerability and try and remain as objective as possible. As well, as I mentioned, it's regularly updated. And this is an important one. Um, I was just at the Tripwire user group here in Toronto on Tuesday, and I was talking about something that I call vertisms, um, sort of little statements that we have in vert that we try to you know, discuss, hold true, that have meaning to us. And one of those was the vulnerability scores can't be static. And it's a problem that we have with a lot of the scoring systems out there. The, the scores are set and they stay there. They don't move, they don't adjust, they are just static. And when you look at a, a vulnerability, you know, the Verizon report is a prime example of why age should impact the, the, the criticality, criticality of a vulnerability why it should increase score. At the same time, risk and skill can change. Skill changes quite frequently when you have, you know, exploit DB at the new script, when Metasploit Canvas or Core Impact release uh, a new exploit, you know, an exploit kit, so Black Hole, Cool Ice, any of those uh, start to contain new vulnerabilities. And we review all of those weekly to make sure that we are increasing the score. Um, that we are properly reflecting the risk to your environment. At the same time, um, you know, risk also increases and changes. A vulnerability may be discovered and reported as a denial of service. That could just mean that the person who found the vulnerability was only smart enough or knowledgeable enough to turn that into a denial of service. It doesn't mean that somebody with much more knowledge in that area isn't going to come along in three months, six months, a year, and turn that into code execution. So vulnerability scores, at least in the belief of VERT, have to be a living, breathing entity. They have to be something that constantly shifts and constantly changes. And if you look at your release notes, 
um, the, the company your ASPL updates every week, you'll notice there is a massive list of scoring changes. And that's because we're constantly changing them and we try to keep you as updated as we can uh, when those, those scoring changes do happen. So we've spent a long time talking about how we update our scoring, but I think it's time to actually talk about how we score vulnerabilities. This is our scoring algorithm. And, you know, I, I've, I've definitely heard before it's complex for the sake of complexity, um, but it's not if you sit down and take a look at it. If you are interested, and there's a link on the last slide of this presentation that I'll leave up on the screen for a second for people to get a screenshot of, we do have a, a rather large white paper that goes through the, the methodology behind this, the reasoning behind it, some examples, uh, the history of the scoring algorithm. It's a, a rather large and complete white paper. Um, and I'd invite all of you to go and you know read through it. And uh, if you want to discuss anything related to it, um, I, I love discussing scoring. Uh, so I will always talk about our scoring system and other scoring systems for that matter as well. But if we take a look at the algorithm here, um, what we've got is a floor call. That just makes sure it always rounds down. Um, and then we've got the square root of time, vulnerability age, delta t, however you want to refer to that, multiplied by risk factorial over skill squared. Three simple elements that compute to give us a score. Somewhere between zero, and as I said right now, the upper bound is sitting around 65,000, but that moves as vulnerabilities age. And the bulk of that scoring comes from these values. Date, you know, we can discuss date. Date is the date it was first exploited, the date it was publicly discovered, the date that the vulnerable code shipped, um, whatever the earliest date um, that references the existence of that vulnerability is. With risk and skill, however, um, we, we do have these charts that sort of explain and define, you know, what we're talking about. And you can see both the base value uh, and the calculated value for R factorial and S squared. And you can see how remote privilege is the highest uh, and, you know, uh, S squared is at the, the bottom of the fraction. So here you want the, the smaller number results in the higher value. So automated exploit. And, you know, people ask from time to time, well, what do these mean? So on the risk side, and I said, you know, we really have, um, exploit outcome and attack vector mixed in. So we have local and remote, there's your attack vector. Uh, and then we have the outcome. So it does it impact availability, access, does it give you user level access, um, or privilege, does it elevate your privileges to that of admin or root system? Um, fairly straightforward and the, the minimal amount of difference in there is what allows us uh, to be so objective in our scoring. And on the skill side, you know, no known exploit, that one's pretty clear. Automated exploit, again, you know, there we're talking about malware, exploit kits, uh, exploit frameworks. And in between, we have these four other levels. And so extremely difficult. Uh, you might have a couple of sentences. You know, the person who discovered the vulnerability might have put out a tweet that says something along the lines of, Anyone who's looking for this vulnerability might want to look in function and a function name. A few lines, very little information to work off of. Difficult might mean that there's a, a full white paper, but there's still no code. Um, there's nothing working. Moderate would mean along the lines of a proof concept. So there's, there's example code out there, but it doesn't work. Uh, there's changes you need to make in order to make it function. Easy is a script, a piece of working code, um, but it's not in an exploit kit, it's not in an exploit framework, it's not in malware, um, but it's relatively easy to use. As well, anything in exploit DB uh, in our system, if we can find it in exploit DB, we automatically classify it as easy. Uh, we think that exploit DB is a fairly well-known and common repository, um, and that is, you know, a, a reasonable uh, assumption that it's probably fairly easy to exploit something if it exists there. Also, I mentioned that you can customize scoring. Uh, another thing that I'm often surprised that not all of our customers are aware of, um, you know, for more details on this, you can reach out to support. They can help you make these changes. Uh, but we know uh, the, the vulnerability scoring isn't one size fits all. There are always going to be 
differences in organizations. And so we have here three types of modifications, uh, modifications to the date, to the risk, and then some class-based risk modification. So with date, we have two options here, normalization, uh, which removes the date. This really turns us into a more of a bucket system. Uh, it actually makes our scores correspond quite well uh, to the heat map. Basically, each square on the heat map becomes a new bucket, and all of your scores in your system um, will relate to that. Reduction subtracts a year. So maybe you want your vulnerabilities to um, score higher a little faster. So a 2016 vulnerability will turn into a 2015 vulnerability just to give you uh, a little bit more of a speed boost to the age aspect of the vulnerability scoring. With risk modifications, and there's, there's one important note here, uh, if you make these uh, customizations to your scoring, they don't translate over to SIH. So risk modifications apply only to the v &E. And I'm gonna actually jump back a slide here to talk about these. So with the local remote reversal, we're literally just taking those three remote values that have risks of four, five, and six, and we're making them one, two, and three. Local is becoming four, five, and six. So we're just swapping them around. So if you've got an environment that's completely closed off, you know, you're not concerned about remote attack vectors and local you know, reign supreme, that might be a modification for you. In here, we also have vert recommended risk. And what we do here is change it so that it's the two privilege as the highest remote than local, then the two access, and then the two availability. Um, it's, you know, this, it's the scoring system that, that we recommend. If you look at a vert alert, uh, you'll notice that it's actually the, the order that we put the, the heat map at the bottom of the vert alert in. Um, so that is available as well. Vulnerability class-based risk modifications are where uh, I see most people get really excited and look to apply them. And so here we have a set of, I guess two sets really, so from web browsers down to office products, the items that aren't bolded uh, on the PowerPoint. When you change these and you enable one of these settings or all of the settings, uh, anything that is classified as local becomes a remote. So local uh, in our terminology is client-side. Uh, so Flash is a client-side application. It runs on your client. It does not listen for incoming network connections. But for a lot of organizations where they're looking, you know, to consider anything web-based remote because, you know, there's so much web activity going on these days, this is a way to just flip that flag and every Flash vulnerability whether it's local access, availability, or privilege, will become remote of the same one. So local access goes to remote access. And you can see an example of that here uh, in the uh, screenshot that's on this slide. And you can see how a vulnerability in Flash from last year can go from a score of 10 to a score of 654. Uh, so it does allow you to modify and change these values. I know that's of interest to some people. Uh, we definitely have customers using this. And as I said, you can contact support uh, and they can assist you with it. There's also three others that I bolded, exploit kits, exploit frameworks, and US cert advisories. These are three where we feel that you may want to, you know, if something appears in Cool Ice, Black Hole, Core Impact, Canvas, you might want to immediately fix that. Uh, those are popular tools, popular exploit kits. Uh, same for US cert. Many people rely on US CERT uh, for their prioritization. They put out a lot of good information. So with this one here, we actually do uh, skew the scoring. Uh, and what we do is we immediately take anything that appears in an exploit kit or an exploit framework or a US CERT advisory and pop it to that high right corner of the heat map. So they all become remote privileged and automatic automated exploit. Uh, so that's a way to take certain classes of vulnerabilities, manipulate the scoring to better suit your environment. Uh, again, you can reach out to support and they'll be more than happy to help get you squared away with that. And those are the scoring systems and a deep dive into IP360. You know, I said at the start, why do we score vulnerabilities? And we score vulnerabilities, as I said, first and foremost to prioritize. You know, the same question comes up though when you start to prioritize. You know, people who don't understand say, why don't you fix everything? And we all know you can't. Uh, we all know we need to prioritize. And so there are, there are definitely some clear reasons that you can give people uh, as to why you're prioritizing. 
The first one is making your case. It's, you know, not uncommon to, you know, take the security team, approach the operations team and say, we need you to patch these five vulnerabilities. Why? They're busy, you're busy, you know, they want to know why they have to do the extra work. If you have agreed upon set scoring practices, if you have a method of measuring risk in your environment, then you've already prioritized and you can very clearly make your case for why those things should be patched. The flip side of that is the next reason for prioritizing, which is to defend the decisions you've made, to defend the actions you're taking. You know, why did we patch system A over system B? Because our agreed upon priority matrix said that it was more important, that we should patch it first. And finally, to protect your assets, because at the end of the day, that's our goal. Um, that's the goal of everyone in this industry. We want to keep our environments as safe as possible. We want to keep them protected. And the best way to do that is to fix the things that are most critical first. Uh, and so that's why we prioritize. Those are the, the three main reasons that we do it. So here I said at the end that I'd throw up some useful URLs. Uh, again, if you want to, you know, hit print screen, um, I do believe this will be available uh, afterwards. You can always grab it then. That first URL is to the IP360 scoring system white paper. And the next three are a series of blog posts I wrote um, on vulnerability scoring, looking at IP360, looking at CVSS, um, looking at some of the, the shortcomings uh, of some of the scoring systems that are out there. Um, you know, I welcome discussion on any of those. There, uh, again, you know, scoring is one of my favorite things to talk about, um, and I'm, I'm more than happy to discuss it. That brings us to the end of the conversation on scoring uh, and on to the FERT status update, uh, which I'm also giving, so uh, I'll just continue forward. Uh, there's only a couple things to talk about here. One is I wanted to mention the IoT Hack Lab and IoT hacker tra hacking training that we did at Sector here in Toronto. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, one, because you know, it was a lot of fun for us to go and do it, and two, um, we had some really good conversations with uh, both customers and just other conference attendees uh, about the security of IoT devices um, and you know how they're popping up everywhere. And so we ran a full day training. It was developed by Craig Young. It's been taught previously uh, at Ossert down in Austra uh, Australia and at DEF CON in Vegas. Uh, so this was the third time that it was taught. We had about 40 people in the room. And they went through extracting firmware, uh, hacking a router, uh, hacking a Wemo, and hacking a home automation system. Um, and so that's, you know, just a little bit of awareness. Craig is planning to teach us at more conferences in the future. So if you happen to be attending a con, uh, take a look at the training, see if it's there. Uh, there's definitely some interesting stuff in it. As well, we then spent two days running a hands-on IoT hack lab. And you can see a photo there of some of the gear that we had available. Um, a whole stack of people came by. And uh, it's interesting to note, um, you'll see on the, the left-hand table, there's, there's three black routers standing up there, the TrendNet routers. Uh, we had ordered them a month before uh, from Amazon, and they shipped with two-year-old firmware um, that had known vulnerabilities. You can update the firmware, there are patches available, uh, but they ship in a vulnerable state, and we had 40 people uh, successfully hack the router uh, sitting there over the course of the two days. On average, it took people about 30 to 45 minutes with minimal guidance uh, in order to completely own the router. And also, Zero Day was discovered while we were there, so it's a good reminder that if you know, you're interested in security research, walk into, uh, you know, in Canada, Canadian Tire, uh, in the States, I guess, Target, Walgreens, uh, I don't I guess Walgreens is a drugstore somewhere, um, Walmart, there we go, uh, and, you know, pick up any device you can find there, and it's a good way to sort of get your hands dirty, get a little technical, uh, and there's a good chance you're going to find a brand new vulnerability. And so I just wanted to reference that. And finally, uh, for those of you that are IP360 customers, um, I thought you might want to know uh, some of what we've shipped in the last uh, month or so. We've improved our cold fusion detection, uh, the Cisco September update, and the Oracle October update. Uh, we've shipped all of the content from those. 
as well as full updates for OSX, WordPress, and VMware vCenter. Uh, a big one that a lot of people have been interested in is Docker. We've shipped remote detection for the Docker daemon, so you can find it installed on hosts even if you don't have credentials. We can also identify the client on both Windows and Linux hosts. And on the Linux host, we'll take it a step further and actually enumerate the containers uh, that are active on the host and report those back in the application instance data. Windows Server 2016, uh, which a couple of customers requested, is, is also now shipping as of this week's Aspel package. Uh, ideas. I like to mention ideas every chance I get. Um, it's, you know, one of my favorite parts of uh, the Tripwire Customer Center. Uh, I get to interact directly with customers. All of your vulnerability management coverage ideas come directly to my mailbox. Uh, we look at them, we triage them, we prioritize them. And uh, even if you don't have your own idea that you want to submit, go and look at the submitted ideas. If you see something that interests you or that applies to your environment, upvote it. Uh, there are promote and demote buttons. Uh, we use the the votes as a way of determining priority. Uh, you know, it's it's our scoring method for that. Uh, so definitely go take a look, uh, contribute there. Uh, I really appreciate it. It's you know usually the most fun I have on any given day is uh, is dealing with those requests. As well, uh, last month we added uh, Java instance data. Uh, this month we've added Adobe Flash instance data, so now you can find where those um, rogue Flash installs are that sometimes end up that you don't even know are there. And then finally, two that I wanted to, to touch on a little bit more. Uh, the first one's an NVIDIA driver vulnerability. It's not something that I would normally call attention to in an update like this, uh, but it's actually an interesting one uh, as it was discovered by IP360. Um, and this happens from time to time. Um, you know, the NVIDIA released a buggy driver update. It didn't play well with RDP. Uh, one of our rules came across that, and an investigation um, led us first to uh, working with Microsoft, and once Microsoft rolled out remote desktop to working with NVIDIA, they identified that it was a vulnerability in their driver, uh, and they released an update. Uh, we do have a blog post out about that. NVIDIA has a, an advisory out about it. Uh, it's definitely interesting when something like that happens. Um, so I wanted to reference that. And then Matrix SSL, this is a popular variant of SSL on IoT devices running on the GoAhead web server. Uh, one of our researchers, Craig Young, has been doing a lot of research with it lately uh, and discovered a number of new vulnerabilities. Uh, those have now been patched and details have been released, so we have shipped coverage for those as well. And uh, that's everything I had to talk about, so I'm going to turn it back over to Ed, and thank you, everyone, for your time. All right. Thank you, Tyler. So we've reached the end of our session, and we'd like to, I'd like to thank our presenter today, Tyler Regulie. Thank you for sharing your, your presentation and expertise with us. I'd also like to thank you, uh, everyone on the call, and including our, our valued Tripwire customers. Thank you for attending. We hope that you found this session valuable, and we'd also love to hear your feedback. So at the end of this session, a survey is going to appear on your screen, just a very short survey. We would love to um, hear your thoughts on how we can make these sessions more useful for you. And also we had uh, a longer presentation today. We weren't able to do the Q&A session. So if you do have any questions about today's content, today's presentation, um, enter them into that survey window and we will get back to you with an answer. And also, um, if you missed part of today's session or you'd like to forward this to a colleague, um, we will email out a, uh, a link to a recording of this presentation and, and the presentation slides themselves. So you're welcome to review those and forward those to a colleague. So we'll go ahead and wrap up today's session. Thanks again for attending. Goodbye. <laughs>